In my particular case, I became interested in irrational behavior while being in hospital. I was badly burned from a magnesium flare. A magnesium flare is one of those bombs that the military sent to the sky to light up a battlefield. And one of those got exploded next to me, and I was burned in about 70% of my body. And as a consequence, I was in hospital for about three years. And in hospital, there's lots and lots of irrational behaviors to observe. For me, the, the initial one, the one that gutted me the most curious and puzzled and also in agony, was the question of how you remove bandages from a burn patient. So imagine that you were a burn patient, that most of your body was covered with burns, and every day the nurses had to remove your bandages. And now ask yourself, what is a better approach? To remove the bandages quickly by ripping them off one after the other, making the duration short, but the intensity very high? Or should you take them off slowly, taking a long duration, but each second not as painful? So think to yourself, if you were faced with this decision, what would you prefer? How many people here would prefer the quick ripping approach? Raise your hand. How many people would prefer the slow approach? Okay, about 50-50. This is also a test of how many of you have read any of my books. <laughs> <laughs> so the nurses in my department thought that the ripping approach was the right approach. Uh, in retrospect, I think that they got this intuition from how they used to wax their legs. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, they thought this was the right approach. And as the patient, I did not like that. And I used to argue with them. And I used to plead with them. And I used to say, please, slow it down. Take more time. Don't do it as fast. And the nurses told me two things. The first thing they said was that they knew what was the right decision. They knew that with their experience, they know what is best for me. The second thing, they reminded me that the word patient doesn't mean to butt in or intervene or make suggestions. It means to sit there quietly and being passive. I'm sure in Spanish it's the same uh, passive meaning. Now, I was very interested in pain, so I decided to do some experiments on pain. Initially, I didn't have much money for research, so I went to a hardware store and I bought a carpenter's vice, something like this. And I set it up in the lab, and I invited people to come in and put two fingers <laughs> in this vice. And I would turn it around a little bit, and I would crunch people's fingers a little bit in all kinds of durations, long pain and short pain. Pain that went up, went down, up and down, down and up, all kinds of versions of pain. And after each of those, I would stop and I would ask people, how, much did you, how painful was this? And how painful was this pain? And if you had to experience one of the last two, which one would you repeat? Which one was not as good? What's called revealed preferences. People gave me their answers. I published my first academic paper. And I got more research funding. <coughs> so I moved to better equipment. <laughs> Noises, electrical shocks. I even created a suit. This is a suit with 300 feet of hoses. You can see the hoses coming up here, stitched through it. And I could get people to be very cold and very hot. I had a, a huge um, vessel of water with, called as ice and a huge vessel that was very hot. And I would get people really miserable, either with cold <laughs> or with hot. And across all of these experiences, by the way, I also did experiments with people winning and losing money, which ends up being very similar to physical pain. Across all of these experiments, I found that the nurses were wrong in three systematic ways. First of all, if we take an experience and make it twice as long, we don't make it twice as good or bad. We call this duration neglect. We don't pay as much attention to the duration. On the other hand, if you change the amplitude of an experience, you change dramatically how people evaluate it. And the nurses thought that it's all about the duration. They were trying to minimize the duration at the expense of the intensity, doing exactly the opposite of what they should be doing. The second thing was that the nurses did not think about the progression of pain over time. It turns out that if you start with a low pain that increases over time, it's much worse than high pain that goes down over time. And mostly for reasons of convenience, the nurses started at my leg, it ended up at my head giving me the wrong progression over time. 
And finally, it turns out that for really long periods of pain, more than 30 minutes, for example, you do want to give people a break. You want people to be able to kind of recuperate, brace themselves and prepare themselves for the next period of pain. And those were three lessons that the nurses missed. Now, here is the thing. These were kind, wonderful people who wanted the best for their patients, who had plenty of experience, and nevertheless, they were getting things wrong. And it's not as if they said, oh, we don't know what to do. No, they had conviction. They thought they knew what was the right thing to do, but what they were doing was the wrong thing every day for every patient. And from that point on, I started thinking about what are some other cases in which we're sure we know what the right answer is, but it's the wrong answer. And with this certainty, we keep on doing the wrong thing for our clients, our companies, our citizens, whatever it is. And that's really the, the topic I want to talk about today, not in pain, but in other areas. The reality is that we see with our brains and not with our eyes. We think we see with our eyes, but we see with our brains. And because of that, our brain has the capacity to basically fill in the picture in the way that it expects to see the picture. And because of that, the reality that we, is out there and the reality that we experience are two very, very different things. Now, why do I start by showing you visual illusions? Vision is the best thing we do. If you had to pick a good human skill, it would be vision. We do vision many hours of the day. We have a huge brain part dedicated to vision. We're evolutionary designed to do vision. And nevertheless, we have systematic predictable mistakes in vision. And if we have these systematic predictable mistakes, table illusion, the cube illusion, attentional problems, what are the odds that we will not make mistakes in things that we don't have a long history and much experience? For example, decisions about health, or decision about finance, decision about relationship. And in all of those areas of life, most likely we'll have even larger systematic and predictable mistakes than we have in vision. So I want to move now to other decisions. <clears throat> and I want you to think about visual illusions as a metaphor for the rest of decisions. Something that we all have, it's basic, it's about the way that our brain processes information. And because of that, we have this bias in how we make decisions. <clears throat> this is my favorite plot in all of social science. It's a plot that shows the percentage of people in different countries in Europe who are interested in donating their organs. And when you, what, what you see very clearly is some countries give a little and some countries give a lot. <clears throat> and when I ask my students why, why do you think some give a lot and some give a little, they think it has to do with culture. You know, usually when you give a gift to somebody, you get to look them in the eyes, you get to give it to them, you get some reciprocation, some smile. In organ donation, not so much. <laughs> why would you ever give your organs to somebody you don't know? Maybe it's how close societies are, how connected you feel to them. Maybe it's about religion, maybe it's about the law. <clears throat> What's also interesting is if you look carefully at this list, you would find countries that we think about as being very similar, behaving very differently. For example, Denmark, only 4%. Sweden, 86%. Austria, 100%. Germany, only 12%. And the comparison I find the most interesting is between Holland, the Netherlands, with 28%, and Belgium, with 98%. Now, I learned over time that you don't tell either the Belgium or the other people from Holland that they're similar, but, <laughs> but from here we can think of them as similar. <coughs> now, what's interesting about Holland is that Holland got to 28% after a huge marketing campaign. They sent every citizen in the country a letter begging them to join the organ donation program. There was coverage on the radio, there was coverage on television, the begging letter, we don't know how much it cost them, what did they get? To 28%. By the way, they also had a reality show in which they took the person who is about to die and they took people who wanted their organs and the person who was going to die had to decide. Uh, that show did not stay on the air for a very long time. <laughs> but with all these efforts and public awareness, they got to 28%. So you can say, what did Belgium do? What did Belgium do to get almost everybody to participate? And the answer is, 
they have a different enrollment form. That's it. Here is the story. Some countries <coughs> have a form that looks like this. Check the box if you want to participate in the organ donation program. And what do people do when they get such a form? They do nothing. They don't check and they don't join. These are the countries on the left. The countries on the right have a slightly different form. It says, check the box if you don't want <coughs> to participate. <laughs> and what do people do now? The same thing. They don't check. But now they join. <coughs> and this is called opt-in and opt-out, and it's about defaults. And it's such an important issue that I think it's worthwhile spending a few minutes on it. So first of all, we all have a tremendous sense of agency. We all feel that we are making decisions. We decide what to eat and what to wear and how to drive, and we decide and we decide and we decide. But what this tells you is that the person who is designing the form on which you express your opinion have more to do with your decision and your own preferences. This is called choice architecture. The idea is that the environment in which we are being placed has a lot to do with our final decision. By the way, it doesn't mean that we don't feel that we are making the decision. It just means that that's not the real cause of the decision. Imagine that I send you all to the Department of Motor Vehicle where you could get one of those two forms. And imagine that half of you would get the opt-in form and half of you would get the opt-out form. And imagine that you made decisions just like these Europeans. If you got the opt-in form, you will not donate. If you got an opt-out form, you will donate. And then you came out and I stopped you and I say, why? Why did you decide not to donate and why did you decide to donate? Do you think anybody would have the insight to say, I did it because the form told me to do so? <laughs> I did it because I was too lazy to think about it and I took the path of least resistance? <clears throat> of course not. You would all tell me fantastic stories about why you decide what you decided. <laughs> the stories will have nothing to do with reality. And they will be fantastic stories because they will portray you as a wonderful, thoughtful, caring person. They will be fictions about why you're such a wonderful person and why this decision was really the right decision, but they will not be about the truth. They will not be about what really caused you to behave this way. And by the way, this tells you you should always suspect when people tell you why they're making the decision they're making, and it should also make you very suspicious of focus groups, which are very dubious instruments. <coughs> um, the other thing to realize is that Opt-in and opt-out and defaults and the path of least resistance are clearly important for things we don't pay attention to. If you have a form for a credit card, the credit card application, it's a five-page form, and you only read the first half of the page, whatever is written in the other pages as the default will be carried out because you don't pay attention. But defaults are also important for things that are big. Because as decision gets bigger and more complex, what happens? We don't know what to do. And as we don't know what to do, we do what? Nothing. And when we do nothing, we let the person who decides what the default is to decide for us. And finally, I should say that defaults are incredibly important because you can think about lots of cases in your life where you have some defaults. And you can ask yourself, are those defaults that you have for yourself and for other people the right, the right defaults? 